Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com. And you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry. And we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Well, good morning. How are you? Y'all praying for rain? Anybody? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Yes. Man, we need rain. Amen. Hey, I'm glad you're here this morning, and I want to welcome our Facebook crowd and our Etex crowd who watches during the week and watching this morning. We're glad you're with us. Over the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about that church is more than a chair, that uh, we're really glad you're here, but there's more to Summit Heights than just sitting in rows and sitting in these chairs. And, and if that's all you can do this morning, we're really glad you're here, but we want you to know up front, we have an agenda. We want you to be involved, and we want you to be a part of what God's doing. And so if you've been here over the last couple of weeks, you know that we've talked about a couple of myths, the holy place and the holy man myth, that there's nothing spiritual about this building. It's an old hardware store, and uh, we used to sell, uh, they used to sell a whole bunch of stuff out of here, and now it's just a metal building. And I told you that, hey, if you've ever been up here at 2 o'clock in the morning, you'll know there's nothing spiritual in this building, I promise you. Because when the alarm's going off at 2 o'clock in the morning, I carry a pistol, amen? Because uh, this is a scary place up here. We also talked about the holy man myth that uh, somewhere along the journey in church, we decided that it was one man's job, the pastor, to do everything. And what we've talked about over the last few weeks is, is that God's called all of us. In fact, if you were here last week, we talked about what it means to be involved, that when we're involved, we're known, we're seen, we're valued, and we, we want you to be a part of that. It's not one man's job. Not one man can do everything, and God never intended that. And so we've been talking about this whole connection thing, and uh, I've loved the stories, this story this morning of baptism and our, our children's ministry. For the very first time in 14 years as a church, we finally got Ashley on stage to share and, and to show us what goes on in our children's ministry and our student ministry and the stories that's going on in our student ministry and, and then celebrate recovery if you're here a few weeks ago. And all those stories all make up that, hey, there's more to do at Summit than just sit in a chair. And what I want to do this morning, I want to talk out of Philippians chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, you have your apps, you can turn there. We're going to have it on the screen. We're going to be out of the New Living Translation this morning. But I want to talk about this thing called service. And I don't know about you, but uh, all my life, I've always had one of these. Anybody else have ladders? I gotta be honest with you, um, there's something about humans. There's something about men. There's something about women that we love to climb ladders, don't we? And not, not physical ladders, uh, but there's always something in our journey that we love to climb the ladder. Uh, and I gotta be honest with you, I'm afraid of heights. In fact, in the first service, I wanted to climb this ladder and then I started looking at how far the concrete is up on the stage and I got about two steps up and I said, that's probably not a good idea. Uh, I'm afraid of heights. And it seems like every mission trip I've ever been on, uh, I, we were down on the Mexican border years ago and uh, uh, we were painting this two-story building and, and we didn't have a ladder that would reach the eaves. And so we, a bunch of college students decided the only way to paint those eaves is to get on the edge, hang over our heads, and paint the edges this way. And I ended up being up there on the building. I'm just, I, I don't know why I always get stuck on ladders and buildings when we're in Haiti or Guatemala. I'm always up on the peaks of the roofs. And I'm telling you, I just, I don't like heights. But the, see, here's what I know about ladders. Not physical ladders, but in all of our life, all of us love to climb ladders, don't we? And at the bottom of every ladder, there's this sign, and they say it differently in all these ladders, but they say basically this, if you'll climb this ladder, all of your desires will be fulfilled. 
jobs, relationships, it doesn't matter. In fact, you remember that first apartment, that first one room apartment you had, and maybe you got a roommate and then, then you met him or you met her and you scrounged up enough money to get that one bedroom apartment or that single wide trailer. Danielle and I, that was our first house together. Is that little uh, 16 by 70 foot long single wide trailer. Some of our greatest memories are right there. And then we moved over here and we bought a two bedroom, two bath house and started having kids and kept having kids. Still don't really know how that happened. But anyway, um, and then we added on a room and then all of a sudden we realized we need more room. And so we climb one more rung up that ladder and we get a bigger house, four bedroom, two and a half bath. And, and then I'm, I'm believing somewhere in the future, there's going to be about a 3,800 square foot house on the beach. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, don't look at me all spiritual. You know what I'm saying. Uh, it's just something about climbing ladders, isn't it? And maybe, maybe for you, it was making the team and you, know, you, you were a sub and you got in and you became a starter and then life went on. You were all conference, scholarships, college. And, and, and for very few, there's that all-American first-round pick, all-pro in the Hall of Fame. It's something about ladders that we climb. The higher we go, the more status we have. And here's what I know about us and here's what I know about me is that status feels good, doesn't it? We, we like to be known. In fact, we like to feel important because it gets us attention. There's something in all of us that, that we desire attention and we're gonna climb that ladder to the high spot because we want somebody to pay attention to us. Look at me. In fact, the higher you go on a ladder, the more people can see you. And it feels good to be looked up to. It feels good to be catered to, doesn't it? it feels good to be special. But you see that concern for status can be dangerous because really what that does is it's just putting us first. It's making me first. And we're tempted to say when we start climbing that ladder, look at me, look how successful I am and look what I'm doing and you should respect me and you should do it my way because look what I've done. And you get higher and higher and higher. And if that attitude begins to creep into the church, I just gotta be honest with you, it gets downright evil. It gets downright evil because the result is conflict and arguing, dissension, and eventually it just ruptures the church when we begin to jockey for status. In fact, in the church of Philippi, Paul was writing to the church in chapter two, verses one through five, it's on the screen, read along with me. It says, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? He's asking some questions. Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in his spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? And then verse two, he says, then, if any of those answers, then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another and working together with one mind and one purpose. I love verse three. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. And don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. Verse five, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. See, here's what Paul was saying in those first few verses. We're going to read on in just a minute. But here's what Paul was saying. Don't be concerned about how far you can climb up the ladder. Instead, think about how far you can come down. Think about how far you can come down that ladder. You see, our aim is not to climb the ladder. It's really to climb down the ladder. And listen, before I go any further, I want to say this. Because I think some of you need to hear this. Because some of you don't believe this. Because some of you already feel like you're below the ladder. And life doesn't go your way. See, I believe that, that God created everybody in this room nine months before you were born. That at conception, God created you. And let me tell you what God did at conception is God created you with unique gifts and talented talents so that when you were born, that you could begin to live to your potential. And so everybody in this room, you were given gifts and talents. And then in salvation, you were supernaturally charged, so to speak, with those gifts and talents to make a difference, to make an impact, to flourish, to make a living, to make money, to earn, to impact the world because our lives do matter. It's the reason we do things. It's, it's the reason you chase promotions. It's the reason you chase leadership positions. It's the reason you wanna make a difference. We encourage our kids to go to college. Why? Because we want them to get a good job. We want them to make money. I remember, remember 
remember when I was offered a job that just offered me more money than the guy had sent. And I remember talking to my dad about it. And my dad said this, and I understand this as a parent now. My dad said, nothing would bless me more than for you to make three times what I'm making and what I made in my life. Because see, there's something in us that we want to make a difference. And there's nothing wrong with wealth or influence. But those things alone won't change the world. And there aren't what we were made for. You see, we just don't work for a paycheck. And I know some of you are going, hang on. Yes, I do. <laughs> see, if we're honest, we really want something more than a paycheck. We want a payoff. We want to know we're making a difference. We want to know we're making a difference. And yeah, we got to make money. I get it. Everybody in here is eating well. I'm looking around the room. You look good. But see, if money is all we're after, we're not living up to our fullness, fullest potential that God has created us for. He said, I wrote, uh, I wrote down on our elders retreat on one of the sheets when the guys came in that really big wins are a collection of small steps. And for some of us, we need to realize that God has created us and these small steps we're, we're taking every day is gonna create those big wins. But see, here's the dark side of gifting. Now I think this is where Paul was getting. The dark side of gifting and service and creation is that we make it all about us and money and position and fame and notoriety. And we forget that we were created for something bigger, that we were created to worship God, to magnify God, that everything that we do and all of our gifts and all of our potential and all of our money and all the things that we have, everything that God has given us to create all that is to be focused on one thing and that is to magnify or worship God. Ultimately, it's not about me. It's not about you. In fact, the church is not here to meet your wants and even your needs. <laughs> I love what Rick Warren said in that wildly popular book, The Purpose Driven Life, where he just, his first point, the whole chapter, it's not about you. <laughs> the body of Christ exists to live out Christ's mission. That God has called us to that bigger thing. And he's made us with unique talents and personalities and skill sets. But see, Paul knew there was a dark side to that. And I think that's why he said in verse four, he said, don't look out for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. That each one of us should not only care about ourselves, but there should be something in us as Christ followers, as people who call ourselves Christians, that we should be looking for the interest of others. And then he gives us an example in, in verse five, look at it. He says, you must have the same attitude. <laughs> attitude. I'm gonna let that rest for a minute. <laughs> had the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. See, Jesus was our example. Jesus is our example. Jesus came down the ladder. He came down to the lowest level because, because his, our interests were above his own. See, we live in a church and, and, and our model is not someone who ascended the ladder. It, our, our model is not someone that started in the mailroom and became the CEO. Our model is not that, that immigrant that comes over and strikes it rich and all of a sudden becomes powerful. No, our model is one who descended the ladder, who came down among us and lived among us to serve our interest. That's our model. He went from omnipotence to obscurity, <laughs> from stardom to slavery, from riches to rags. That Jesus is our model for what it means to be a servant. And he came so far down the ladder that when Paul said, your attitude, our attitude, my attitude should be like Christ. You see, he came so low, he became a man. Look at verses six through 11. It says, though he was God, he didn't think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges and he took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the highest place and the highest honor and gave him the name above all other names that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Listen, Jesus started at the top. He was equal with God. Think about that. He sat on the throne in heaven with the Father. He, in his very nature, he was God. The angels worshiped him and bowed down to him. In essence, his being was one with the Father. He was just like God. 
He was the one who spread the galaxies as we sat on our back porch at night with our kids. I mean, look at all the stars and realize that God waved those all into existence. That at the snap of his fingers and the spoken word that he created man and he created man and mankind so that he could spend time with them and walk with them and love them and be in relationship with them. But then those people sinned and sin brought sorrow and brokenness between man and God. And because of that brokenness and that separation, that sin separated us from God, that's when Jesus, I don't know if the conversation took place in heaven. I'm not sure that they, they sat down and Jesus said, hey, dad, because that's what my son says, hey, dad, a lot. <laughs> but I'm sure there was some conversation there where Jesus and the father realized, where Jesus realized that his equality with God was not something to use for his own advantage because see, that's what I would do. If I'm just really honest, I would wanna keep that status. And Jesus knew that his equality with God was something to be used for our interest, not his own. That the very nature of God is not to be a getter, but a giver, that God gives. And to be equal with God means to be the one who goes. And so Jesus came. And the only way for God to deal with sin was to send Christ to live among us as a human to pay the penalty for those sins. Only God could do that for only God could live among us and not sin himself, amen? Only God could live perfectly and not end up having to pay for his own sins. And only God could live free of the penalty of sin and therefore take the penalty upon himself. The son looked at the father and didn't consider his equality with God something to be grasped to serve his own interests. No, he made himself nothing by stepping into our world, becoming a servant to serve our interest. He came down the ladder. He didn't come as a king of his own creation. In fact, he didn't even birth himself into a ruling class. He could have so easily put himself into a Roman ruling class because that's probably what I would have done. And at the very least, I would have put myself in a middle-class family, you know? I mean, if I'm gonna step out of heaven, at least I'm gonna go to a middle class. No, Jesus didn't do that. He didn't give himself a head start in society. He made himself nothing. In fact, he put himself in the hands of the poorest couple he could find in a conquered nation, in a backwater town that was a Tijuana of that day, Nazareth. You know what they said about Nazareth? It was such a dump. Nothing good can come out of that town. That's what all of them said about the town around them. You see, Jesus made himself nothing because deep in his being, he was taken on the essence of a servant. At the core of his nature, he waved the galaxies into existence. He was equal with God, but at the core of his nature, he became a servant. He is our example. He took on humanity completely. He got hungry. I sometimes wonder, the first time Jesus' stomach growled, what his mama thought? The first time he got tired, that he actually got splinters because his dad was a carpenter. I, I mean, I know what I would have done if I was equal to God. If I got a splinter, splinter, come out. That'd be a fun trick, wouldn't it? <laughs> he understood weakness. He knew the pain of betrayal. <laughs> and when all of them thought they were above doing the servant's work, Jesus did something incredible. In fact, that story where all the disciples were gathered in the house, when they all thought they were going to be served, Jesus did something incredible. He took a towel and he wrapped it around and he went to each of those men and he washed their feet. He made himself nothing because he came to serve. But there was another step Jesus took. In fact, Jesus took one step further. How far would he go? Well, we know the rest of the story, right? You know, the thought for me is, why didn't he retain a little bit, right? Because he was entitled to everything because that's the way I think, right? I'm thinking, hey, if I'm gonna serve something, I'm gonna keep something for me, right? Come on, y'all don't look at me all religious, all right? You know what I'm talking about. You see, Jesus humbled himself even further and he let himself be killed. He let himself be crucified. Why? For us, for us. If his service was gonna matter, it would have to go that far because death was the only thing that would remove sin's curse from us. The sacrifice that Jesus came 
that he would take upon himself and be crushed, dying in the most humiliating way that was ever conceived for terrorists, for criminals, for slaves, man. Jesus took upon our sins and those nails that were driven into his hands and his feet as he hung upon the cross. And the longer he hung there, the harder it was for him to breathe. And he took all of our sin upon him so that you and I could be made right with God. And then three days later, God did something incredible. That three days later, Jesus, after he went to the death, he was buried in the grave. People forgot about him. I'm sure there were people there in, 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 in the area going, I knew he wasn't real. I knew it wouldn't last. Some of his own followers ran away. Some of his own followers going, Psh, denied him, forgotten. And just when it looked like he was done, God raised him up and he exalted him. Look at nine through 11, it says, therefore God elevated him to the place of the highest honor and gave him the name above all other, and gave him his name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He descended to the lowest level and yet God elevated him and exalted him to the highest place. Gave him the name above all names, Yahweh. That those of us who call on the name of Jesus would be, will be saved. <laughs> and he stands in his glory today. And one of these days, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. Even if you don't on this side, I mean, I realize some of you are here this morning and you don't believe. And by the way, I'm really glad that you're here because this is a safe place for you to come and be loved on by people and investigate the claims of Christ. But listen to me, one of these days, it's coming that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And if we'll share in his humility, I believe that we will also share in his glory. If we go down the ladder, go against everything our culture teaches us, our culture teaches us to climb the ladder. And yet Jesus' example is, is that we go down the ladder and we become servants that God will exalt us. In verses three through five, he says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, Consider others better than yourselves. Come down a rung. Each one of you should not only look to your own interest, but also to the interests of others. Come on down. And by the way, your attitude, come on down another rung. Come, come join me down here. Your attitude should be the same as Christ. You see, our example is the servant, the Christ Jesus. In Christ, we have all the promises you see, last week I talked about that, that there's Jesus the Christ and Jesus the Lord. And very honestly, we love Jesus the Christ because in Christ, we are fully loved and fully forgiven. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He's going to bless us. He's going to always be there. And we love that part, don't we? It's fun to preach on that. But the problem is he's also the Lord. You see, in the Christ, it's what we get. And we love to get, 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 don't we? The problem is in the Lord, we give. And by the way, that's in every relationship. Do you know that? Every relationship, there's a give and take. And if all you are is a taker, then you're a narcissistic person. Can I just be that blunt? And by the way, in our relationship with God, if it's all about him giving, 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 then you're a narcissistic follower of Jesus. You see, there's two sides of that. And we don't like talking about this side, do we? It's more fun to talk over here because it makes us feel good. But the problem is in every relationship, there's an obedience involved. In Christ, we have all the promises. We get something. In the Lord, we get to give something. That we get to be a part of what God's called us to be. And the way we start with that is in service. In fact, let's go on and read the next seven verses in Philippians 2, 12 through 17. And here's what I want to do, okay? I want you to read this out loud. And we're going to read this together. And I want you to look at the words that we're fixing to highlight in this passage. So let's read it together in Philippians 2, and this is going to be audience participation. You ready? Here we go. Verse 12. Dear friends, you always followed.
do everything. Come on, keep going. Verse 14. Verse, there it is. Come on, keep going. Verse 17. Isn't that good? Just hearing God's people read his word. <laughs> now, I want you to notice something in those, in those verses you just read. Because we love Jesus the Christ. And listen, if you have a relationship with Jesus, you are fully loved. You are fully forgiven. And there's nothing you can ever do to change that. But listen, as a result of that, we now get to obey. Look at the words in verse 12 where he says, work hard. There's work involved in this. Any relationship worth having is work. Do you know that? And it's the same with our working out our salvation with Jesus. Because the reason we work hard is to show the results of our salvation. There are results. Did you know that? And then he goes on obeying. There's that word, obeying God. And then there's the desire and the power. You can have all the desire in the world, but that ain't gonna win you championships, you know it? You gotta go out and work. You gotta be there. I love what he says, do everything without complaining and arguing. That would be huge. <laughs> Shining. Hold firmly. You ever held on for dear life? White knuckled it? We were at the football game the other night and these kids were climbing up the side of the bleachers. They were trying to get money from their mom and dad because that's what kids do is beg us for money, amen? And I remember I looked over there and this little girl was climbing up and she was white knuckling it and I was like, because <gasps> if she fell, it was gonna be a resurrection moment. Jesus would have to resurrect her. Paul's talking about hold firmly. And Paul, I love, I love this statement where he says, I will be proud. Do you know we can be proud of what God's doing? That when we work hard, there is something. To, I, you know, I, lo I love this. I, I came up here on a Wednesday before our elders uh, retreat, and, and I was loading stuff up with my son, and we were getting stuff out. And I'm telling you, this place was like Grand Central Station. People were coming in, getting food. They were getting help. I mean, it was just over. And I, I got Jake that afternoon. I said, man, is Thursdays like that every week? He said, what are you talking about? I said, today. He goes, dude, today's Wednesday. I didn't even know what day it was. He said, yeah, it's that way all the time. People coming and going. And then on Fridays, all the food we give away and then celebrate recovery and then our kids and, and the backpack program and all the food and all the things. I'm just gonna tell you, man, I drove up to Lake Quitman for that retreat and I was like, yes. Paul says, I, I will be proud. And he uses that word, run the race, that my work, that even if I lose my life, service, offering. You see, we love Christ the Lord, our Christ, but he's also our Lord. And so, so every year, y'all know, know the routine. We come together this time of year and we get you to sign up for service, right? And let me just be real honest with you, what happens, we have about 30% of you guys that sign up and, and it's usually the same 30% every year. So here's what I'm not gonna do today. I'm not gonna ask you to sign up for anything, but I'm gonna tell you something. Here's what'll happen if you decide to have the same attitude as Christ is that you'll begin to discover and develop your spiritual gifts in ways that you've never dreamed or imagined. Because there's something about serving together serving on a team, that you begin to discover things about you, that God has made you, that God has made you to fit together with the other pieces of the body. Remember we were talking about being involved last week, that all parts of the body fit together? You'll begin to discover those things. But I'll tell you something else, is you'll begin to see some miracles that you've never seen before. I was reading this last week in John chapter two, the very first miracle that Jesus ever performed, and something just jumped out of me. I've been doing this for a long time. And I gotta be honest with you, I've never noticed this. And it was Jesus' first miracle. He went to a wedding and, and the host of the wedding ran out of wine. And so Jesus noticed that they were panicking. And so he goes to them and he says, listen guys, I can take care of this. And so he says, take all these jars and I want you to fill them up with water. 
And the servants went, huh? He said, just fill them up. And when the servants started serving what they thought was water, it became wine. Now, now here's what I noticed about this. The guest never saw the miracle. Only the servants saw the miracle. Isn't that good? (laughs) That just blew me away this week as I thought about that. All the people that were partying, they didn't see it. It was those guys in the kitchen that saw the miracle. See, service is going to allow you to experience miracles. It's going to make you more like Jesus because you're going to get your eyes off you. And you're going to start looking at others. And you're going to surround yourself with other people. See, there's something about serving together. I've been on mission trips. We sent Gary and Sylvia off this morning. They're going on another mission trip. Some of you have been with Gary and Sylvia. And let me tell you what happens on a mission trip when you get away and you serve together. There's a bond there that you can never break, man. It changes you. I can still run into guys through the years that we've been to Haiti with, Africa with, been to the Baltic States with. We've been all over the world together. And there's something about serving overseas, man, on a mission trip that's going to bind you together. I think that's why Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, spur one another on towards good love, towards good, towards love and good deeds. Not giving up, meeting together, but encouraging one another. There's something about serving that encourages you and, and, and increases your faith. That you'll, you'll begin to see those miracles and you'll begin to believe God for more. But it'll also allow you to experience God in ways you've never dreamed or imagined. You see, encouragement and healing go hand in hand. Encouragement and healing go hand in hand. As we encourage others, they find healing. And we're encouraged. As other people encourage us, we find healing. And I know what some of you are thinking. And you're making all kinds of rational explanations right now, going, Edward, I don't have time. I can't serve. I get it. Danielle and I are looking at our schedule this fall. We have one night off during the week. Volleyball Monday, church Wednesday. Junior high football Thursday, high school football, band Friday. Tuesday's like our night home. We're tired thinking about it. I get it. And I know some of you are thinking, man, I don't know what to do. I don't have any special skills. Listen, you do. And I think what some of you have forgotten is that when God created you, when you were conceived, God knew you. And he put in you certain gifts and talents. In fact, I I could sit down with anybody in this room and in about an hour and a half, I could write your story and we could lay lay your story out and we could show all the places and we, we could start connecting the dots and I could show you your giftedness. I could also show you your failures because every one of you are failures. Do you know that? I'm the chief. I'm telling you. I'm an expert on failure. In fact, I'm preaching a whole series on failure coming up. So come back, you bunch of failures. Amen? All right? Listen, the whole Bible is God's response towards failure. The whole Bible is full of men and women that didn't measure up. I mean, think about... Think about... Y'all remember Moses? Y'all remember him? Stuttering? Stuttering Moses? And Moses was chosen by God to bring his people out of slavery. A million people! I sometimes get frustrated with 600. I couldn't imagine a million. Amen? How about David? He was too young. He was too insignificant. And then when he did, and he killed the giant, and he made the king, the guy that wasn't supposed to be there, then he got arrogant. He got into the dark side of leadership and took his gifts and his talents that God created. And in that dark side, he did something very evil. And then how about Paul? We've been reading him all day the murderer of Christians. His whole goal before he became a Christ follower was to hunt people like you and me down and kill them. What a great guy. We'd never call him as a pastor or something, would we? But God would. So that's the beauty of Summit. For some of you, you're going, man, I don't have time. I don't know what to do. I don't know what. See, see, we do two services here. I don't know if the 11 o'clock people know this. We have one at 9 o'clock too. Just some of you are like, really? Wow. Um, the beauty of Summit Heights is you can serve one service and go to the other. And there's a lot of you that do. And there's some of you that haven't discovered your giftedness. And you haven't discovered the camaraderie. 
And so I just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you something in closing. What's your attitude when it comes to serving? Think about that. Well, Edward, I'm just, um, I'm just too good for that. I did my time, son. Cause see, I, I, I was an old, I'm an old man. I'm an old woman. It's time for them young bucks to step up. Really? Jesus came down. What's your attitude? Where are you serving? And if you are serving, what's your motivation? To be seen? To be powerful? And I know I told you I wasn't going to ask you, but I am. Will you serve? Will you? It's more than a chair. And by the way, if that's all you can do, keep doing that. But for some of you, you've been sitting a long time. And it's time. Even if you don't go here and you go to another church, go back home and get involved. And have the same attitude as Christ. And serve. Find you a place. Now, I'm telling you, there, you can be involved in so many ways at Summit. From small groups to ministries to maturing to missions. By the way, every one of you are on missions. you know that? The, day, the moment you leave here today, you're on mission. Don't forget that. So, will you? Will you? I hope you will. Father, I love you. Thank you for today. Thank you for your word. God, thank you that you do love us, that you died for us. And God, because of your death and your resurrection on the crawl, out of the grave, God, we have life. And God, I know there's some, probably some folks sitting in here this morning that don't know you. They've never confessed their sin. They've never confessed you as Lord. God, I pray you'd give them courage today that that would be the step they take to surrender their life to you and be obedient in baptism. God, I know there's some folks here that they've done that, but God, very honestly, somewhere along the way they got burned. Somewhere along the way they started climbing a ladder and think they're important. God, I pray today you'd give us courage to examine our hearts, our attitudes, our motivations. For some of us, that's gonna mean some confession, working through some repentance. For others of us, Lord, that just, it's gonna mean courage to take that step and begin to experience those miracles and that faith and those gifts that you've created us to make an impact in this world, to magnify you, to worship you. So God, I love you and I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for this holiday weekend. Protect us, Lord, as we hang out as families and um, Lord, I love you. We ask it all in that beautiful name, Jesus, and everybody said, amen. I love you. Have a great week. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.